What up, baby buddy? What up, West Kid? The honeybees are here straight from the hood. We only roll in two colors, yellow and black, and we be getting no respect, and it's getting kind of whack, y'all. Do you know what would happen if we just up and went? You'd be fooled by the facts if you knew just what it meant, y'all. No more sweets, ice cream, and no more honey, no more veggies and fruit, nah. That just ain't funny. Let's get the word up and work it out. This new right here is what it's all about. I'm Casey Eisenberg. We're here this morning at Forest Hill farm in Cornelius where we're meeting with George Hansen. So tell me George, what are we doing this morning? Well beekeepers in Oregon are basically uh, pollinators, not necessarily honey producers. The bees have been here on this farm pollinating the crop and uh, basically as you can see the bloom is over and the bees are done and the farmer needs to get on with his work so he's asked to have the bees removed and so we're picking them up and take them to their next job. Okay, great, let's go do it. All right. The farmers in this area grow lots of crops that require pollination. American agriculture is, is moving much, much more to monocultures, large areas where one thing is grown. Farms are getting bigger and, um, and so the number in, in the case of uh, of say blueberries where we were this morning, um, the number of, of pollinators that might be in an area with that much acreage, there just simply aren't enough. So they have to augment that and then there's a certain amount of insurance value too that you just want to control it. You want to know how many pollinators you have. Uh, there's no question that the number of wild pollinators, native pollinators, whether they be birds or uh, bats or uh, other insects, butterflies, they are in decline, which is probably just because of environmental issues and, and the loss of habitat. Um, we spray the ditches and we uh, kill the pests. As it turns out, the beeswax itself is, acts as a sponge. It actually absorbs most environmental chemicals. Whether the beekeeper is putting it in the hive to try and control a, a, a mite or, or some other problem, but also the agricultural chemicals, which are just like everywhere, and they get on um, on the blossom, the bees bring it back and they gets brought into the hive. So we used to think that our big problem was just simply insecticides that would spray down the bees, would kill the bees. But now we're seeing that there are a lot of things that are sublethal, but are being collected and st actually stored in the hive. It's in their home. They're having to live with this stuff. It is dangerous, and we are taking risks, okay? But we're, do, we're there for a reason. The farmers need, need us, and they know they need us. And we have amazing cooperation from the farmers. They have worked out schemes where they don't spray while we're there. Now, this morning, they were out there, and they were spraying, but they knew that I was picking up my bees and leaving. Farmers know the value of bees, and they're paying for them, so they have hardly any incentive to, uh, to be careless with this kind of thing. You know, we know that the old organophosphate uh, chemicals have a lot of problems with birds and with re uh, reptiles and fish and as well as uh, insects. And so we're trying to get rid of them. And we have whole new groups of insecticides which are being used. And they're all being measured by their toxicity to honeybees. Contact on the bee. But to try and get away from that spray where we're actually spraying and contacting uh, bees, they've gone to systemics where they're actually putting the chemical into the plant and then if an aphid eats a, the plant then it, it goofs it up and, and that's the way they control. The problem with these insectic insecticides used as systemics is that although we avoid all that spraying that we were so afraid of, now it's finding its way through the plant matter including in the pollen and the nectar. So the bees are collecting this stuff, and although it's in very, very low levels, we really don't know. When they collect that, it's a part of their food, and they take it back to the hive, and they feed it to the young. We really don't know, and we're not asking chemical companies to test. What is that doing? There's, you know, for us, there's a big difference, yes, between being alive and being dead, but all that in between is, is what the bees and humans have to live with. 
clearly we don't want to have lethal things, but um, we, we also don't want to be sick all the time either, which is kind of what we're afraid might be happening to bees. Globalization is, has affected honeybees everywhere. Um, honeybees are native to basically northern Africa originally, and uh, um, some of the things that have happened that uh, by taking honeybees to Asia where they're not native and then um, bringing other products here, we have spread pests and diseases which our honeybee doesn't know anything about and has no defenses against. We've spread them all over the whole world. And that's, they've, uh, a lot of our activities in trying to take care of the bees have to do with um, controlling some of these exotic pests which have been brought to us and continue uh, to be brought to us. Our industry has been just completely turned upside down and changed completely by vo the varroa mite, a brood mite, which was imported. Um, through the whole globalization process. Whenever we just start bringing things in willy-nilly, uh, we're always taking the chance, whether it's a raspberry plant or an apple variety or a new strain of wheat or whatever it is, when we bring these things in without proper safeguards, we're, we're really putting a whole industry at risk. And I think we need to be pretty careful about that kind of thing. What made you select this particular piece of land for your honeybees? Part of it was just the sense that um, we wanted a lot of wild forage for the bees to work on when we weren't involved in any uh, pollination. We've used this area and areas like it where we have agreements with farmers um, to clean the bees up, you know, get them out of an agricultural area and put them in an area where they have good forage, but um, don't have to deal with a lot of agricultural chemicals. And so this has turned out to be kind of a safe haven. We also use our management. We just bring the bees here so that the workers can have all the tools they need. They get a lot of work done. They don't have to drive all over the countryside to get to this 20 hives and that 10 hives in another county or whatever. So the bees always come here. They're marshaled, they're fixed up, and then they go out to wherever they have to go. But we try and get them into, um, into a clean area we have timberland, which is great. Not a lot of honey in it, but uh, you know the timber companies spray too. So no way we could call this organic. But we're certainly not being pestered by agricultural chemicals on a daily basis. So what solutions are there to make beekeeping specifically more sustainable? I think we need to be taking a really close look at the broad uh, implications of what we're doing with chemicals. When we, when we test chemicals, agricultural chemicals for one thing, and then we use them in another way, or we combine them with other chemicals without having tested to find out what is going to actually be the impact, I think that's pretty stupid. And I think that the EPA and, and that the agricultural industry just simply has to swallow their pride and go back to base, to, to basics and uh, and try and figure some of these things out, even though it might, they might take a hit. If everybody switched to organic, which is what a lot of people feel the solution to these problems is, how would that affect your business? Uh, they still have to have pollinators. Organic farms, some of them are pretty big. Uh, and one of the biggest problems, actually, I should say, for a variety of reasons, the wild honeybees, they've been decimated by all the problems that are causing uh, our hives to, to uh, sometimes suffer and there's nobody taking care of them. So if we solve that problem, there would be a more of a background of bees, but whether there'd be enough, even if there was an organic orchard, I need an insurance policy. I'm gonna rent some bees, I'm gonna bring them in. So I think it, it, would, make, it would make a lot of changes that I don't think it would run um, a good operator out of business. And we might be able to make more from honey and uh, this uh, relationship of between Pollination income and honey income might balance back again, and it would make some sense. It would make honeybees more healthy overall, and it would, they'd be able to do a better job. Clearly, my business would be a lot easier and a lot more fun if I didn't have to worry about chemicals all the time. Um, and the bees would succeed more. Uh, whether it would make me rich, I, I don't know, but it would certainly, I would sleep better. 
Well, George, thank you so much for letting us come out here and sharing this with us today. Sure. Happy to have you. I wish there were more solutions. <laughs> I'm Casey Eisenberg, bringing you the tools to be sustainable today.